All right. All right, well, hello everyone. Um, you will have just seen that we are recording. So um, just as a quick reminder, we record all of our InterReach webinars and post them on our InterReach webinar archive. So you can navigate over to the website to view any old InterReach webinars. Um, and I also wanna just say hello and welcome to our first InterReach webinar of 2022 and the sixth installment of our ongoing series on science facilitation. But before we begin, I wanna take a few minutes to um, just express, express our gratitude for the members of this community and for all the effort and time that you contribute to make this community of practice um, the source of co-learning and co-creating that it is. So thank you so much. And I also wonder um, if we have any newcomers on the call today. If you are a newcomer, do you want to just give me a little sign, maybe raise your hand or give some kind of a, um, hi, Joanna and Mercedes. Awesome. Hello. Welcome. Great to see you on the call. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, and just a reminder, and, and for those that are new, this webinar is just one of the few programs our community of practice facilitates as part of our dual mission to um, develop the profession for interdisciplinary integration experts and to provide professional development by way of education, training, and thought leadership. And so all of our programs are communicated via, via our website, um, which is interreach.org. Um, and it's interreach with one R. And um, our, less, our listserv, which I'm going to drop a link to in the chat right now, if you'd like to join us there, you can um, follow along with what we've got going on. So there's the link to our listserv. Um, and um, you can also always feel free to email me or our co-founder, Christine Hendren, who was not available to be on our call here today, um, but uh, she will be joining us for all of our other um, webinars and office hours and um, our reading and discussion club. So I'm going to drop a link to our email addresses here so you guys can feel free to email us. Um, and then finally, I just want to remind everyone and um, for those that are new to the um, uh, to our community of practice, if you go to that, um, the link I sent for Listserv, you can see archives of all of our old um, emails to the Listserv. And so you'll be able to see more information about what I'm about to talk about, or you can just email me and I'll forward the link to you. But anyway, um, I want to remind everyone that our um, 2022 call for proposals for thematically linked webinars and reading and discussion clubs is now open. So we invite you to propose individual or mini, city, mini series webinars similar to this series on um, science facilitation with paired related post-webinar reading and discussion club sessions. And these would be on topics related to being the webinar, or sorry, being the webinar, being the arrow <laughs> on complex research projects. So for more information, please see our um, submission form, which I'm gonna drop a link to in the chat right now. So you can go there for more information. Um, and also, um, again, feel free to email me or Christine Hendren with any questions about that offering. So um, any questions about that before we get started with today's webinar? Feel free to um, ping me in the chat if you'd like to, um, I see I have one. Uh, oh yeah, Sarah, hello, Sarah, welcome. Um, Excellent. Okay, if there's any questions, please feel free to, um, to email me or, um, or ping me in the chat um, if you've got any questions. Okay, so with that, we're going to get started with today's webinar. Um, and so our speakers for today are Dr. Ellen Fisher, and that's Ellen with an E, and Dr. Ellen Dickman with Ellen with a Y. Um, so Dr. Fisher currently serves as the Vice President for Research, or the VPR, at the University of New Mexico. She has a PhD in chemistry from the University of Utah and brings hands-on and applied perspectives from over three decades of work on interdisciplinary science teams. 
Her background as a chemist, material science scientist, higher education administrator, and research integrity officer informs her research and practice with transdisciplinary scientific teams. Dr. Fisher has created numerous cross-disciplinary university offer, uh, programs to support interdisciplinary research, encourage ethical practices, and create a culture of inclusion and support for women in science. Um, and Dr. Dickman has over 30 years of experience in various positions, including associate dean, associate professor, director, and founder of social of the social science, a social science institute. Um, she's a co-director of a higher education um, and pre-K research and development center and a consultant supporting domestic and international businesses and academic institutions. She has a PhD in education and human resources uh, studies from the University of Col um, or, sorry, Colorado State University. And Dr. Dickman specializes in grant writing and proposal reviews, research and evaluation design, data collection and analysis, team science training and facilitation, social network analysis, strategic planning, group facilitation, and professional coaching. So thank you to both Dr. Fisher and Dr. Dickman for joining us today, and I will hand it over to you. Well, welcome everyone. It's a true joy to be here. And I'd like to start off by, uh, first of all, saying our discussion today, we're hoping is gonna be fun, enlightened, that you're going to learn something. And, you know, our topic, as you know, is the art and science of changing organizational culture. And before we really get started, I want to uh, give my appreciation and Ellen's appreciation. I go by Ellie usually, um, but myself and Ellen would like to really send our appreciation to Interreach and to the Facilitation Guild, everyone at the Guild and Hannah Love and Alyssa Stevens for getting this going with Interreach. And these are two organizations that have extremely positive cultures and it's been a joy to work with, with them. So thank you to, to both organizations. And now Ellen and I are going to introduce each other. So five facts about Ellen, I'll go first. Um, she loves cruciferous vegetables. How's that for a start this morning? And her favorite is cabbage in the upper right. And um, she also enjoys making lists. I kind of have that joy too. Uh, she's absolutely a strategic thinker. I have seen her uh, in the process of thinking strategically and the wonderful end results. She always has that type of a process going in her mind. It's almost as though there's a side screen. And she is a total science geek. And I'm sure, Ellen, you've been keeping track of the James Webb telescope um, process and launch on Christmas Day. And her guilty pleasure is goldfish, not the swimming kind, but the kind that you eat, the goldfish crackers. So Ellen has been wonderful. I've known her um, for many years and I'm gonna have Ellen introduce me. Yeah, so Ellie um, is really a, a, a conundrum in some respects in that um, she's kind of this mix of, um, she loves to paint, she's incredibly creative. And so the sort of nerd wrapped in a creative burrito is probably the, the best possible way to describe Ellie. Um, she brings both the art and the science to everything that she does. Um, I would also say that she's incredibly adventurous, um, that she's actually swum, swum with sharks, swam with sharks. Um, she swam with sharks and she uh, has also jumped out of an airplane and things that I've always said, why would I jump out of a perfectly good airplane? It just doesn't make sense to me. So um, she also has this real knack for challenging people and um, belief systems. And it's a pleasure to work with her from that perspective in that, um, you know, sometimes we can can get all wrapped up in our own ideas and there's always um, Ellie standing there going hey but yeah wait a minute let's talk about the other side of this or whatever so um, that's actually a really great trait um, to working with Ellie is that you always get that wait a minute let's think about it from another perspective and then most recently, she has decided that she wants to learn a lot more about art history. So she's been uh, teach, learning and reading and, and so forth. And I think that's just amazing because it also demonstrates that she's a lifelong learner and is really interested in that kind of stuff as well. Um, with that, 
um, let's see if I can get this to change. There we go. Um, Ellie, I'm going to turn it back over to you. Great. So we're going to do a really quick grounding this morning. And what I have up here, what we have up here is four photos. And what I'd like you to do is just take a deep breath, take another sip of coffee, um, and get in your head a little bit and think about which one of these photos really is resonating with you right now. And what I'd like you to do is just take a few seconds, think about that. And I'd like you to, um, in the chat, type in which photo resonated with you and then just maybe one or two words about why. So take your time. And what I wanna say is I wanna put a plug in here for another InterReach webinar that I watched uh, that was held by Ann Herberger Marino and Sarah Stevens about mindful uh, facilitation. And I just wanna give a thanks to them. I got the idea for this type of grounding from them. And so we'll take a look and wait for your response in chat, one, two, three, or four, and why one of those photos is resonating with you this morning. I'm a little used up from 2021, therefore the cracked ground. Mm. Ah. Dried up, cracked earth. I, I love the ones about uh, number four, but I think that's because I had Indian food for dinner last night. <laughs> ah. Oh, the warmth of the color for number four. Wonderful. Oh, the geometry of the cracks. I love geometry. Oh, looking for healing, number four. Nurturing and growing, number three, wonderful. Soil. <laughs> We're getting a little lesson there on the, on the soil too. That's awesome. Yes, thank you. <laughs> the color and the love of turmeric, yeah. Oh, three, teamwork. <laughs> so is there anyone that would like to unmute themselves and just share briefly um, what photo resonated and then just share with your voice with the group. Uh, why? Is there someone out there that would be open to unmuting and Um, Elia, I can say uh, I chose number two largely okay. because um, it's clear that there's something being changed in the landscape. Um, mm -hmm. and, and if you're laying sod down, you're probably working with a pre established, within a pre established space, but creating something new within it. Oh, thank you, Ralph. Thank you for sharing that. I like that. That's really good. Thank you for taking the time and grounding a little bit and us all coming together around where we are today. So Ellen. Yeah, so I am just gonna tell us, uh, this is a slide really as a transition to um, what we're gonna be spending most of our time today on. Our goal really is to discuss artful and scientific strategies to affect changes in organizational culture. And with this, we really want you to have fun. We want you to ask questions. Um, the presentation we put together, as you can already see, there's there's a lizard theme to it, and uh, and we were, we had a lot of we have a lot of other fun uh, fun things to think about in in terms of how we can go about doing this. And ultimately, as Christine said at the beginning, this is really all about co-creating as well. So we'd love to hear your ideas, and and. And just let's let's just jump right in and get going on this. So um, the first thing we're going to have you do, um, and this is a chatterfall. And if you haven't done this before, it's real easy. We're going to ask you a question like the one that's on this slide. What role do you play in your current or prior organization? And what we'd like you to do is type it into the chat, but don't hit return just yet. And then we will count it down. We'll go three, two, one, and then everybody will put it in all at once. So what you end up seeing is sort of this waterfall or chatterfall of um, responses coming out. 
And so we're going to do a couple of these. This first one is just what role do you play in your current or in a prior organization? Um, and we just want to get an idea from this of what uh, you all are. And so I hope that with me babbling on here a little bit, you've had a chance to type it into the chat, but not hit return yet. And I'm going to count us down now. We're going to go four, three, two, one, and hit return. So it looks like there's project managers, product project coordinators, there's leadership team, um, taking helping faculty take their research to the next level, more managers, project coordinators. Okay, excellent. So now, um, as you keep doing that if you want, um, what I would say is the next one, we're gonna do a second chatter fall. And this is what is one thing one thing, just one, <laughs> you, can, you have to pick one, one thing that you would like to change in your current or prior organization. So just one thing. And again, type it in a chat, but don't hit return yet. And um, I will give you a minute to do that. And, um, and then we'll say, we'll count it down. Um, and so one thing that you would like to change or that you would like to see change in your current or prior organization. And again, I'm going to count you down from four, three, two, one, and hit return. Yeah, meet in person. Oh, I hear you there. Uh, diversity and inclusion is being mentioned. Ellie, are there others that you see? Um, improving the culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Mm -hmm. And hopefully some of the things that we're going to talk about today in terms of actual processes or activities that you can uh, take while facilitating to help with that process. Increase collaboration mm -hmm. across disciplines and more clarity surrounding team and stakeholder interactions. Nice, okay. So when we talk about change, um, you know, another thing I, I think maybe um, we can do this without doing a chatterfall, but as, as we're talking here about change, maybe if you guys could type into the chat and just go ahead and hit return on this one. But what comes to mind when you think about change in general, and especially, you know, so change in general, when we think about change in general, what does that bring to mind? What's the, what are some of the words that we associate with that? And then when you think about change in organization, what are the kinds of things that you think about? And I'm seeing some great things, resistance, inertia, buy-in, um, hard to get everyone to agreement, you know, uh, it can be painful, um, all those things. This is awesome. I want you to, I, uh, is there some, no one likes change. I, I tried on this slide to put at least one, what I would say positive word about exciting is anybody thinks exciting is <laughs> change is exciting. Um, I don't know. Okay. Monetary cost. Oh yeah. That's, that's something we, you know, healthy, okay. healthy. Yeah. Absolutely exciting. Good. Cause I, I always think if, if you don't, uh, if, if you aren't, you know, you've growth, think about it as growth, right? Growth is change and growth is a positive thing. So, ah, Christine, good point. A change is exciting for individuals. So it's difficult when, and, uh, when on scale, you're right. When you have a lot of people engaged. Yeah. Um, so this is great. So keep that in mind as we move into this, I'm going to, I'm going to turn it over to Ellie now um, to talk about what change looks like today. So in preparation for our conversation this morning, I looked at blogs and research papers and uh, consultant websites, all, all sorts of, um, I looked at all sorts of resources. And this particular uh, quote, the pandemic didn't change, didn't create a world of unprecedented change, it accelerated it. And as I read that from the, a blog on Medium, that really resonated with me and I hope that you, it resonates with you as well. And the fact is that we've always been changing and the acceleration rate in the last couple of decades has just been um, unbelievable, but the pandemic really did accelerate that. And what was accelerated is access to knowledge, technology and changing ideas, and then really what it accelerated is people asking, what do we need now? And Ellen and I really wanna encourage you that because of this unprecedented change and 
the cultural change we're going to talk about next, that you really can make a difference. And I, I want everyone, regardless of your position, however long you've been with an organization, to know that you can make a difference as a facilitator and in different realms at work. Um, and my favorite thing is to be bold, learn, and grow, um, like my endeavor of starting to get into art history. So be bold. And then the other thing is, is that you can learn to lead and affect change. It's, it, it is a learning process and it takes time and, and experience as well. But really, um, we're just in an accelerate, we're in a world where the rate of change has just been dramatically accelerated. So let's jump into um, a definition for today and that's organizational culture. And I looked at many different, I looked at many different disciplines and looked at how they uh, defined organizational change. And this is what I came up with. I, I borrowed from different definitions and I added some things to this. And um, it's really about the way organizations behave, attitudes, beliefs, assumptions, and rituals. And um, so that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about organizational culture. We just discussed what change is, how it feels, what people think of change. And now culture is, it really is bottom line, the way we do things about around here. And so, you know, do you celebrate birthdays? Uh, what do you do? Do you go out to, uh, for drinks and um, socializing after work? And sometimes, Culture is formalized and other times it's not, it's just implied. It's the unwritten norms. It's the unwritten way we do things around here. So this is the definition that uh, Ellen and I, and uh, we'd like to share with you today as we go forward. And it really is an organization civilization. So I've worked in higher ed for years. And higher ed is one of the arenas in today's world that has really had the shift, one of many, many. And higher ed now is asking itself and had to ask itself as an organization, who are we? Really, they really need to, they've really needed to examine their culture. Who are we? What do we do? What distinguishes us? A lot of higher ed institutions have closed their doors um, and higher ed is now looking at how they communicate who they are. And they're really looking at, again, the behaviors, their attitudes and beliefs and what really needs to change. And if you keep up with any of the literature around what's happening to higher ed today, um, massive changes. And it's, it's become more of a, let's try this. Does that work? No, let's try that. So a lot of experimentation. So the higher education culture is really really shifted into the mode of what do we need right now? Okay, so one of the things we thought we'd do is again, sort of we're trying to make this as interactive as possible. And um, Ellie just said in sort of the definition that this is about behaviors, attitudes, and beliefs. Um, that happen in an organization. So we're, we're um, going to ask you to complete this sentence of, I worked in an organization where, and then complete it either about behaviors, attitudes, or beliefs. And at the bottom, we've come up with a, uh, from our own experiences, we have come up with a, um, uh, an example for each one of these where we have, I worked in an organization where employees believe that education should be provided for everyone. I worked in an organization where everyone had an attitude of what's in it for me. I worked in an organization where people behaved like they were the only ones who deserved to be there. Um, and so um, if you think about that, and again, I think that with this, um, we can have a, some conversation. I'd like to encourage conversation if somebody wants to just unmute themselves and, and you know, say, say what their sentence is when they think about that sentence. Um, but if you don't want to do that, please feel free to also put it into the chat. So anybody have anything they want to share about, um, you know, and it can be either positive or negative about uh, behaviors, attitudes, or beliefs in an organization. <laughs> the belief was that the cream rises to the top, which looked like white males. <laughs> 
Oh. We, um, I worked in an organization before my current role where um, it sounds like it's a positive because everybody is really bought into the mission. But because of that, everybody also didn't pay attention to their own mental health needs and their own wellness needs and instead just worked and worked and worked and killed themselves for not much return, especially when the highest leadership didn't buy into the mission as much as the middle management did. It's very common. Hmm. You're so steeped in it. And oftentimes it takes leaving the organization to find out really how unhealthy it was. And yeah. How healthy you need to get. A hundred percent agree. Yeah, that was exactly it. It wasn't until I started in this role that I realized just how bad it was. Yeah, and I just want to share that Joanna just put something really, really nice in the chat about how being in a in a um, organization where attitude and belief wants to improve culture and behaviors are sort of trailing behind that. Um, and I think that's that that's very common as well that we see that in organizations. Yeah, and Ralph also saying that, you know, you know, we really believe in the importance, we maybe even give lip service to the importance, but we don't know how to translate it into action. And I think that's another really common, uh, common thing that we see in organizations. Um, oh. I'll, I'll jump in real quick. Um, one of the things that's been kind of a laugh, so you don't cry thing at our campus lately, is that, of course, we're a medical campus, so we have a lot of COVID going on. And I think a week and a half ago, we had 1,100 employees out on quarantine. So it's been a little crazy. But the thing that, here's the laugh part, is that, but last week, when everybody is, you know, we have a hiring freeze on, all these things are happening, but they announced that the, the chancellor just got a 33% increase in salary. <laughs> Oh my goodness. Oh, everybody, everybody that has openings in their divisions and everything, we're all just like, really? Really? Do they are they that far removed that they don't see how that's going to affect the rest of us? We can't we we don't even have housekeeping anymore because we have to all empty our trash. It's not that I mind, but because all the housekeeping from all over campus has had to go to clinical because they've lost so many people from COVID. So anyway, wow. that's just my two cents worth. <laughs> Wow. All right. Well, on that note, um, we'll move on to the next slide. <laughs> uh, thank, you. <laughs> thank you, Linda, for sharing that. That is, that is the kind of culture that could use some shifting, changing. Um, and I'm sure there's some repercussions from what has just happened on your campus. So let's look at what can happen when a culture no longer works. And um, I, can, I can see, I can imagine that you're looking down this list going, I can relate to that. And um, when a culture no longer works, uh, things such as um, how coworkers have connected has changed. Communication strategies uh, changed. Uh, mixed and confusing messages, Linda. That was, you know, here you've got no uh, support in terms of janitorial services and people are out with COVID and the chancellor gets a 33% increase in pay. And those are some confusing and very mixed messages around resourcing. So um, what can happen? Rates, of rates and levels of conflict can increase. And that can look, look like a variety of different, uh, it can look differently, such as people will hole up, not talk, isolate themselves, and then other people will get very involved with uh, expressing the dislike of the issues they have. And so con conflict can become very obvious. Um, and one of the things Ellen and I were hoping today is to talk about how shifting culture and what you can do could actually help increase productivity. Um, but oftentimes what you end up seeing is people's productivity goes down. And one of my favorites here is that, just go back just a quick second. Sorry. No, no worries, is that um, subcultures, cultures within the organizational culture, they start to emerge um, and change and morph and also get ignored. But every organization has a sub subculture. Okay, thank you, Ellen. <laughs> so the question, why is it hard to change organizational culture? What are, 
what are some of your thoughts? What are some of thoughts? Just go ahead and unmute yourself. Why is it so hard to change organizational culture? From your experience. Well, this is Bethany. And I think one thing I've seen is people are afraid of the conflict. They'd rather avoid conflict than have change. It's just too, it's just too hard. Yeah, too that hard. conflict, being conflict avoiding, avoidant for your own mental health and physical health, possibly. Um, what else? Why is it so hard? Well, this is Stephanie. Um, one of the things I've learned is that oftentimes organizational culture changes one conversation at a time. So it's labor intensive and time consuming. I mean, it really takes commitment to have it happen. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that's why it's hard. Absolutely. And thank you. And Marissa, I see that you said individuals have to change and not everyone sees the need for change. Absolutely. That's when people go into denial and, and have, uh, start to have all sorts of express behaviors. Oh yeah, someone else will do it. Yeah, I'm gonna just sit back here. Absolutely. Changing an organization requires activities that are both direct and indirect. Absolutely. These are great. I'm going to, I'm going to go ahead um, and, and say that we've seen, I, I'm going to hand this back over to Ellie, but I was just saying that you, you guys are touching on all these important points. And I, I think um, Ellie kind of put it together in this slide. So why is it so hard? Uh, well, the first thing I want to start off with is that culture eats strategy for breakfast by Peter Drucker. And the thing to keep in mind is uh, that no matter uh, what's going on and whatever an organization might be trying to do in terms of affecting change within the culture of the organization, unless it's changed and it's brought along and it's done thoughtfully, strategically, and includes the art and the science of making change, um, culture will eat strategy every day. So it calls into question an organization, what an organization holds dearly, and I'm going to go back to higher ed institutions, long histories, very long histories, and it calls into, you know, going back to when the organization started, for instance, whatever the organization holds dear um, is called into question. Uh, it's embedded and one change impacts the other parts. So you might think that you're only going to change this little piece at the university, and in reality, it's it's truly connected. And some of those connections might be extremely strong. Um, and then again, I touched on this culture's link to history and the development of an organization over our, overall. So your ideas were um, absolutely spot, spot on, on, your experience. And um, I'm gonna turn it over to Ellen about, oh, I'm gonna continue here, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, the bicycle, organizational culture goes through cycles of change. And this next slide we prepared. So it's a little small, but what I wanna share with you is that regardless of the discipline, regardless of the type of organization, the cycle of change is similar. And this isn't a specific cycle I've selected, but what I've done here is create this cycle of at the very top, the need for change. And then you need to define in the next blue circle, define and align what really needs to change, um, deal with the human elements, look at accountability and, and um, productivity, assess how things are going, realign and keep going. And in the middle of all of that, you need to communicate, communicate and communicate. And then my favorite circles, those green ones, which is denial, which, also, you could read as obstruction, uh, dropping out of sight. But so the cycle of change and changing an organization's culture, um, it, it is constantly changing and shifting. And there's activities that need to be done. There's some tried and true things that will be encountered. And then you're always going to deal with the human element, which is behaviors, one of which is denial. And, and actually, you might and I should really put in here that you'll have people on board, cooperation, champions, et cetera. So the cycle varies on discipline and type of organization. 
Okay, so we're gonna we're gonna now give you some more. Um, we're put, shifting it more towards facilitation. That was about you know just sort of thinking about organizational change and getting everybody into a framework or mindset about thinking about um, organizational change. So the question then is, what can you do as a facilitator of cultural change? Um, and I want to again reiterate what Ellie has already said, saying um, that. Um, this can happen. Uh, it's not always from the top. Change doesn't always come from the top. So you can focus on creativity, science, and accountability. Um, you can increase productivity, even if it's just locally, uh, when, when an organization is undergoing change. And there are some little things that you can do as well. So I'm going to give an example, and then Ellie's going to give an example. For, for me, one of the things with, uh, I just recently changed organizations, and I came into a situation where there um, was uh, not a whole lot of process and uh, not a whole lot of um, transparency around um, how things got done. And so I came in and said, okay, we're going to start doing things with uh, with something that I, I brought from my previous organization, which has, we called it ACT, uh, accountability, consistency, that's two, and three is transparency. Uh, so ACT, accountability, consistency, and tra transparency. And so um, just a very small thing that I started to do is that when somebody wanted to request funding from the VPR's office, I am making them fill out a form. And um, regardless of whether or not I'm supporting it or I'm very supportive of it, even if I have a conversation, I say, yeah, I'd love to love to support that. That's something that we I think we can provide some funding for or whatever. I still say you have to fill out a funding request form. And until they actually fill out the funding request form, I don't we don't do anything with the with the request. Um, and some of the people that I've been working with um, are used to this system where basically you, you just call it, you know, call Saul and, uh, you know, Saul gets you hooked up, right? And and they would just call up the VPR and, and the VPR would say, okay, yeah, I'll give you the money. And then the money would get transferred. And so the thing that I, that I point to with this particular example is that it's a very small thing. We're going to have a funding request form and everyone is going to fill it out. It appears on our website. There are instructions about how to fill it out. We've given an example. We're being very consistent with, with that, with every single person, including just recently had a request from a, the a former president of the university who's working with a, an organization I said yeah I'd love to support this you need to fill out a form he didn't fill out the form and 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 then he you know several weeks later sent me an email hey what about this request I said well I didn't get a form yet so send him the form again still haven't received a request this has been going on for three months so um, but uh, even with something like that I'm very supportive of the project that, that they were requesting um, support for but I said you haven't filled out a form yet so consistency transparency and I'm not breaking the rules for anyone on that on that kind of thing so that was my little story Ellie do you want to share yours I'll just share mine really quickly I worked in a higher education institute I worked with a, within a university and distance education funds came into one pot in the college. And what happened then is the culture was that the dean determined how these funds would be spent. And as the newbie to the college, as the associate dean, I found out that the faculty, et cetera, were very disgruntled, concerned um, that they wanted a voice. And so the culture had always been very top down on how these funds were spent. So I went in and I worked with the dean and I worked with the faculty and again, like Ellen's, this wasn't a, an enormous change, but it was a shift that really did change the culture of the top down. And the shift was that a distance education, of course, we love committees, a distance education committee would be created and the department, the eight department chairs would sit on this committee and help the dean with making decisions. Ultimately, the dean still had the decision, but helping the dean with the decision making and bringing additional information forward about where the really on the ground needs really were. So it, it, on my part, it was conscious. I had to do the, the artistic part, work with people, be somewhat creative, listen really well. And then the actual structural part um, had to be put in place, but that's my example. 
So that brings us to this really great graphic that we're going to kind of go around the horn real quickly and, and talk about this. But if you start in the upper right, where um, you're looking at the, the way this is this uh, is structured is there's the obvious pieces of organizational culture, and then there's the hidden ones. And so if we start at the top with the obvious ones on the science side, um, what Ellie and I both just shared really had to do with systems, policies and handbooks, processes, et cetera. Those are really important. They're very structural and they're very important around organizational culture and they're very obvious um, and they're obvious when they're lacking as well and so that's a really important piece of this but as we said it sort of at the top when we were introducing ourselves you know Ellie said about me I really love lists I always am making lists and this is really great and I'm checking off the lists and so you can get really hung up on the processes and really think about that and stay in that upper right hand quadrant and so and not shift over to the we're going to go counterclockwise to the upper left side, which is Ellie. And in the upper left side, the art is essentially, you know, the human part it's there isn't a science oftentimes it's imprecise it's changing constantly it's very subjective, but what we're looking at is behaviors languages um, purpose and values. Um, and then, you know, the all encompassing working styles. So this is a graphic that we hope you'll find useful. And this ties directly into what we're going to do next, which is share 15 uh, strategies uh, fairly quickly with you. And then what we'd like you to do is stop us as we're doing these or wait until the end. But we're going to now share specific strategies with you on um, what you might be able to do in your organization to try and shift change culture. Ellen? Yeah, so um, what we're, we really tried to focus on when we started to put this presentation presentation together was that there's a lot like on the previous slide that's on the science side so on the right hand side but there's also a lot of stuff on the left hand side so we picked some strategies that we feel have both of those and I think we we, we think it'll apply to any organization and keeping in mind that it's both an art and a science so with that um, back to Ellie so adapt your science to your organization which really brings in the art and so if you think about obviously the art that we have up there, all of the different artists and their styles, um, know that when you're facilitating and trying to make change and adapting, that you yourself are going to have to um, uh, adapt and change. Um, so you are part of the process. So keep that in mind. And so the art and science here and the strategy is adopt what you're doing and your strategies and style to your own organization. Don't always feel that you have to take the strategy right out of the can. Um, make it your own. And next, understand the need for change. This was in the cycle that I showed you at the very top, which is um, as an, it's an art and science to really say, this is why we need change. Some people will say, you know, we have the statistics to prove we need the change. People aren't enrolling. It's a productivity issue. Uh, world events, turnover and staff. Um, and so here as the facilitator, take the time, reflect, and un try to understand as best you can why there is a need for change. And again, it's going to include, you know, a very artistic side as well, trying to figure that out. Imprecise. Oops. Okay. So this is one of my favorites, which is number three, um, avoiding a stampede of zebras approach. And um, this is this is the sort of thing that happens when people are undergoing organizational change. People will start catastrophizing. And so the, the, the deal is that when you hear hoofbeats coming towards you, that you should be thinking it's a horse, not that it's a zebra. And often in terms of change, people really um, uh, don't start there. They start with the worst that can happen. And so um, the, a solution to this, a, a, the art of this is sort of thinking about what you bring as a, thinking about facilitation, um, asking questions, active listening. Um, those are both strategies that can help you, uh, help you avoid uh, the stampede of zebras, but it also can help you help others to avoid the stampede of zebras.
which leads us into a fourth one, which is the uh, going with the resistance. And this is actually um, a, a strategy that comes out of counseling psychology, where um, they essentially the idea is that if somebody throws up resistance to a particular thing, um, you basically say, that's fine, we're going to go with that. And again, this is a really good opportunity to use questions and the co-creation of concrete goals to get past that resistance. And the art here, I think, in addition to sort of the, the, the asking questions and co-creation of goals, is the idea of, of understanding when it's, this is a good idea to use this strategy, because it can backfire. <coughs> you can't have people say, you know, fine, then we're not going to do it. Um, and so it's sort of like, no, you got you to learn when to use this one. So that one is, that's part of the art there. So five is one of my favorites, and that is building alliances. What I'd say here is put away the flames, put away the matches. And when you are trying to affect change, when you are when you do affect change, when you're involved with the facilitation of trying to change an organization's culture, um, you're going to need alliances. You're going to have to, you know, talk with this group, talk with that group, continue to be as authentic, be authentic. Um, and, and certainly be upfront um, and um, be trustworthy, but know that it's important to build those alliances. And we all know that there's an art to that. There really is, and, and a science as well. And Thanks. the next one, understanding time, I don't think I need to say much, but when, you're, when you are facilitating change in an organization, uh, make sure that you know and understand, is this a good time to be doing this? So this one is one of my favorites. I'm very well known for naming the elephant in the room. And I love this cartoon. And if you can't read it, it's only Alan was prepared to acknowledge the elephant in the room. Alan is the one that's being sat on by the elephant. And so um, I, I do this all the time. And um, it, it is a really, um, if you can figure out what the elephant is um, and basically coming up with a graceful way of actually naming it, acknowledging it, saying things like change is hard, Hard. everyone thinks their unit's going to suffer here's how we're going to prevent that from happening those are the kinds of things that that you can bring to the table uh, in the in in cases of organizational change that will help to get help facilitate to the next side is to just literally name the elephant uh, in this case this elephant's name is George at least in my mind so <laughs> Um, and then uh, the number eight is to do the crazy and silly stuff. Uh, again, I've just started a, a new position. And well, it's been about 10 months ago, I started a new position. And one of the things that I've done with my with my team is to just go along with they want to do crazy, silly stuff. We've got a couple students that are working in the office. And one day we had crazy sock day. And I wore crazy socks, I wore mismatched socks, and everybody thought that was the greatest thing that I was I was playing along. And, uh, and so I think that sometimes we just have to do that and say, you know, that's one way to, to get people to engage is to acknowledge that we're all human and there are times when we just are going to be silly. Um, and so I think that's another important thing to acknowledge there. And number nine, there is an art, there is a science to regular check-ins. So if you're either involved with facilitating, lead, leading the facilitation of organizational change, check in with people, be present. Um, and be sure to do such things as celebrate. Um, and this is the celebration milestones achievements um, component that always gets my experiences that gets put on on the sidelines. So make sure no matter what the change, if you can celebrate it. This next one, creating tension tables, I do this. Um, this is one of the strategies I use when it's appropriate, when the time is right and the people are and it's the right people is when there seems to be tension during discussions of change or you're examining culture or the way things are done. When, when it's obvious that there are two different sides, if it's right, I will actually have a group of people in within the group, I'll have a subgroup and I'll have them openly talk about what the tension is in front of everyone. And it's amazing when you choose the right people at the right time in the right setting how well that can work for people to allow the people who have the tensions to just express that between themselves in front of others. 
Um, this is another one that I really like, the art and science of skating to where the puck will be. And this goes back to sort of that strategic thinking. This is a famous quote from Wayne Gretzky. Um, and the real, the real critical pieces here are knowing where your teammates are and remembering that you can't do it alone. It's a team sport. So when you're, when you are, when you're trying to affect change, um, I think it's really important to understand where it is that you're trying to go. And I have a favorite um, I, I'm a big fan of the magic wand and I, and I, and part of that is you wave the magic wand and where are you going to be five years from now? And if you can't identify where you want to be in five years, um, it's really hard to get there. And so that's something that trying to get people to think about that. Like you don't need to be, I'm standing here. That's not where the puck's going to be in a split second, split second, the puck's going to be down the ice and it's time for us to be doing something else. So thinking about it from a futuristic, where are we going to be in five years kind of a perspective. The art and science of reading a room. Um, I'm not gonna say too much here, but over time, if you're in an organization, you might be a natural room reader. See what's going on in the room without really you know, talking to anyone. You can tell by the eye language and head turns and nods and the, uh, the actual uh, hand gestures, et cetera, who's looking at who. Um, it's really important to become a good room reader. It really is. And I do wanna mention that you'll get a copy of these slides as well. So um, Ellen, do you want to do making connections next? Yep. Um, and so making connections, this is really, really critical. And again, this is a sort of a more uh, strategic thinking kind of a thing where what you want to be able to do is, and I always call this sort of thinking like a stage manager or a soccer coach and really thinking about who needs to be where on the stage and when, um, what tools or props or equipment do they need? Um, and if we make these changes, you know, what are all the potentially affected areas? Earlier, Ellie made a point that when change happens, it's like a domino effect. So if you can think strat strategically several things several moves out you can be putting people on stage or in the right place on the soccer field um, at the right time and I think that's another really key things to be keeping in mind is to sort of be making those connections where where is it going to be next and it, it ties to the the puck one as well so 14 the art and science of use the concept of I want that too um, I was going to say contagion but that's normally what I would, would have used prior to the uh, pandemic, but I want that too concept. And I worked in a K-12 organization. And what I found was when I was trying to affect change and much of it was culture related that out of about 40 principles, I had my key go-tos. And if the key people wanted the change, the others wanted it too. So use this strategy. It's more of an art. Um, but if you can get a few people on board, some very respected people, um, it, it really does help and people want what that person has. So um, I would say, give this one a try. And the last one, culture is shared. I just wanna really emphasize this through telling of stories. And um, when you look at how cultures and organizations are shifting, oftentimes, You'll hear people over coffee say something like, well, in 1980, when George was here. Um, so keep in mind that you can tell stories and your stories could help affect as a facilitator of change in an organization around its culture. Use stories, use them in a positive way. Oh yes, Christine, the, po the power of narrative. Absolutely, thank mm -hmm. you so much. And here are our two frogs, you know, I ate the biggest fly <laughs> bigger than all other flies you should have been there um so i a little bit of humor but you know tell stories it can help and i will just add to that one um that um you know, sometimes providing that historical perspective, you know, somebody put in the chat earlier that their organ they worked in an organization where new was suspicious and, and so forth. I think that sometimes telling those stories gives the historical perspective to the newbies and that can help to um, uh, have them understand where, where their organization is now. And so, you know, our advice for the, for the champions here is that um, persistence is really important and perseverance and um, changing organizational culture takes time, perseverance, hard work and commitment. And I have a friend who always says, um, you know, uh, steady pressure uh, consistently applied over time can do great things. And he always uses the Grand Canyon as an example. So that was basically, you know, water consistently, uh, the pressure of water consistently applied over a 
a huge amount of time created the Grand Canyon. So um, something to keep in mind there. And finally, how do you just know what to do, which strategy to use, which new strategy to, to bring in? Uh, Ellen and I talked about this actually quite a bit for this presentation is, how do you know what to use? When do you know what to use? Um, I think it's called watching others make changes, uh, getting a mentor, et cetera. But um, you will know, and it just takes time and experience. Um, and I don't know if we want to just, let, I, I want to keep be mindful of time and maybe yeah. leave a couple of minutes at the end. So if we just go to one last chatter fall, um, and I know we just went through those 15 really quickly, um, but uh, if you could just put into the chat and wait to, to hit return about what one thing did you learn today or what one uh, tip or trick or pretty picture or whatever you want to put in there. Um, and um, I think we're going to do this as a semi chatter fall because um, we'll go to Q and A. And uh, but if you could just, uh, I'll count us down: three, two, one, go, and we'll see what people put in there. And I will go to um, this uh, last parting thought, Ellie. That change is the only permanence, and uncertainty is the only certainty. Yes. Okay, and so then I do want to put up that we will have office hours uh, next Tuesday um, uh, from 10 to 11 a.m. I think that's Eastern time. Is that correct? I don't know. Um, maybe Christine can help. Uh, um, yeah, it's uh, 10 a.m. Mountain time. Mountain 12 time. PM Eastern. Eastern time. time. Okay, yeah. super. <laughs> Thank you. And then, lastly, this is just how to contact us. So, if you have other questions, um, we will be here for a few more minutes. But uh, if you have any questions, um, just feel free to um, shoot us an email. And um, and yes, we will provide a copy of slides, um, and we will uh, we'll definitely make sure you guys get those. And I'm going to stop sharing my screen so that we can see you guys if you want to, um, if anybody wants to ask a question now. More than glad to take some. And thank you so much for being so great. Anyone have a question that we can leave with today? One person? <laughs> Thank you both so much. This was a really, really I loved all of the pretty pictures and and your um, your fifteen takeaways are just wonderful. And I, I can't wait to go back and and rewatch this one. Um, I know I feel like I need um, a little bit of help with the facilitation of organizational change. So um, yeah, any other questions before we adjourn for today? All right, well, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you to everyone that showed up and um, thank you to both of our speakers, Ellen and Ellie. It was such a pleasure to have you with us today. Thank you all, you were great. Thank I love the participation. And see you at office hours. All right, bye-bye.